Hello YouTube, my name is Zach and I am back with another video about The Voice. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the ever misunderstood and ever misconstrued diaphragm. So this is something that I thought was necessary. For a long time in general, this is something that when I have my voice students, I go over this first because there are lots of misconceptions and lots of things that people think they know and they don't really know. So today I'm just gonna break it all down and I'm going to sort of explain everything and tell you why it's important and tell you why it's something that's worth learning about and worth understanding. First off, before we do that, I want to thank all of you that have been following me and commenting and liking my videos. And I mean, it's it's really cool. Like I, I see these uh, YouTubers that say things like, "Oh, it's so humbling and so uh, so inspiring to see people watching the videos." It really is. Like I I made the first video as just a response to the James Labrie discussion that was going on, and the fact that so many of you have picked up on this and like have shown interest in it. It's it's really cool, and I I really think that. Uh, this is something that you all can benefit from. So I'm really happy to do this and I'm really glad that you're all uh, following along and liking this content. So thank you. Uh, tell your friends, share it with people, um, have people subscribe to the channel because I plan on making segments uh, out of this. I have, I have several plans actually for future things that I'm gonna do. Um, I plan on breaking this into three different segments. I'm gonna do a critique on singers because I know all you've been giving me requests for your favorite singers that you want me to do critiques on. I will do that. Also plan on potentially having like uh, Skype voice lessons or even some live voice lessons that I record and put on here so you can kind of see how it all works. And then I also have a plan on doing a segment where I talk about a specific element of singing like I'm doing today with a diaphragm. So that's just kind of gives you an idea of what's coming down the pipe. So if that sounds like something that's interesting to you, subscribe and be sure to follow the channel because there's going to be a lot of cool stuff coming down the pipe that I think a lot of you are going to really enjoy. So why the diaphragm? Like I briefly said a second ago, there are lots of misconceptions. Lots of people think that the diaphragm is just this thing that sits down at your lungs and just sort of sits there and makes breathing somehow in some way. And I find that the more voice students that I get and the more that I ask about the diaphragm, the less I, I think people know about it. Uh, a lot of the common knowledge of it is, oh, you should breathe from your diaphragm. You should... Uh, you should use your diaphragm when you breathe. And that's the extent of what people say. They say, oh, breathe low. And that's, you know, oh, that's what the diaphragm is. And that's what makes it, it makes you breathe low. It makes you sound better when you breathe low. But see, that's so simplified of what the truth of it really is. And that cheapens the singer's understanding of what function the diaphragm actually has on the voice. So I'm going to clear all that up today, and I hope I don't spend 30 minutes doing it, but this is something that you know I, I go over all the time, and I'm really comfortable with and really familiar with, and I'll try to keep it not quite so wordy and condense it somewhat, but I do have a checklist, so we'll see how this goes. So misconceptions about the diaphragm. First off, it's <laughs> people think that, like I said, it just kind of sits there, and it just makes you breathe. And that's true to an extent, but it's a lot more nuanced than that. Uh, people think that the diaphragm is a substitute for the lungs, that it's kind of like the lungs make you breathe and the diaphragm just sort of makes it all engage somehow, which is not completely true either. These are just like general answers that I've heard from various students that I've gotten that have tried to explain it to me. So here's what the diaphragm does. First off, if you're sitting at your, at your desk or your tablet or whatever device you're using to watch this, I want you just to open your mouth. All right, so you open your mouth and nothing happens, right? So I want you now to open your mouth and take a breath. Okay, so obviously there's a difference. When you just open your mouth, it would make sense that, you know, air should go through the hole, right? The, air, the hole that's open that you breathe from, the hole, wait, let me get that straight. The hole is open, the air should come through, but no air is coming through, right? But then when you actually decide I'm going to breathe, something happens like something engages down here and you don't know what well what that is is your diaphragm what's happening is the diaphragm is like a muscle it's like a curved muscle that sits right underneath the lungs and around the rib cage and when you breathe in the diaphragm moves downward to create space for the lungs and for the ribs to expand the lungs hold the air they're like big sacks that hold the air and the diaphragm, not only does it move downward to allow space for the lungs and for the ribs, it also creates a vacuum, okay? So the air moves in 
through the nose or through the mouth down the trachea, which is like your windpipe, so to speak. I, by the way, I pulled this video off of the uh, I mean this this uh, image off of the Wikipedia for the diaphragm. So if you ever want to like just take a look and sort of follow along with this on your own or see where I got this image, that's where I got it from. It's from the Wikipedia for a diaphragm. Um, so once the diaphragms move down, the air pulls through the nose, through the mouth, it goes down the trachea and fills the lungs. And then it does the, the, the oxygen from the lungs goes throughout the body and it does whatever it, it needs to do and provides oxygen to everything in your body. So that's what the diaphragm actually does. It creates a vacuum. It pulls air in. So when you breathe in, that's the diaphragm creating suction. It's creating a vacuum. It's pulling the air in. It's storing your lungs. So that's what the function of the diaphragm is. That's how it works. Okay, so here's the bigger question that's more appropriate to this channel. How does it affect the way that you sing? There are lots and lots of things. So first off, singing is a combination of creating air and vibration. You're connecting the two together, and if the two connect together efficiently and in the right way, you make sound. And you can target your pitches by changing the vibration speed of your vocal folds and all these various things, or lowering your larynx and all this stuff. But all those things start with the air and the vibration combining together. So what the diaphragm does is it engages that mechanism and all the muscles that make it work from down here, like below the vocal folds. All that stuff down there engages. So what it does is when the muscles get underneath, and, and I don't just mean the diaphragm, I mean all of the core muscles that are around the diaphragm, when it all engages, it gives the body support. It gives the mechanisms all above it extra support from the muscles below. Now, it sounds like that's something that might make you tense, but really it's not. It actually helps to relax you. Diaphragmatic breathing is a very well known way of like through yoga and other methods to re help you to relax so when you get a full low diaphragmatic breath what actually happens is your body relaxes because a higher oxygen content enters your body and oxygen is what causes you to relax so that's why they say when you're stressed out or you're frustrated just breathe you breathe in and out a few times and all that extra oxygen flows throughout your body and it releases stress, it releases tension. So having good diaphragmatic support and good breathing actually helps to relax you more when you're singing, even though you have the engagement of all these muscles down below. So it also helps the efficiency of your sound. If you have a good support structure, it's a lot harder for you to use too much air or not enough air when you sing. With the structures working the right way, it's a little easier for your body to sort of ration out the air as the sound travels through. So uh, now <clears throat> a lot of the, the problems that I run into with my students is that they have what I like to call top heavy breathing. What I mean by that, if you, I don't know if you can see through this YouTube, through the uh, webcam YouTube, <laughs> when you can see from the webcam, if I turn to the side and you watch me breathe like this, you can see my shoulders raise up, okay? And what's happening is my diaphragm is expanding, but it's not really engaging the lower diaphragmatic muscles at closer to the abdomen. All those muscles aren't really engaging and the top part is pulling the air up and so my body raises up as a result. Now when you breathe correctly from the diaphragm your stomach will expand outward. It, you'll almost look like uh, my kid students I tell them it looks like the, the puffer fish from Finding Nemo. Your stomach's going to expand out like that. It's going to feel kind of full. That's how you know that you're breathing diaphragmatically. And there are lots of theories as to why we kind of breathe like this instead of outward um actually when we're born and we're when we're babies we breathe more correctly than when we get older and a good example of this if you have any siblings like baby siblings or you know anyone who has a baby family members have babies if you ever watch the baby in its crib when it's asleep if you look at its stomach as it breathes it just rises and falls on its own and as we get older, we sort of forget how to do that. And like I said, there's lots of theories. The one that stuck out to me that I like, and I, you know, this may not be scientifically accurate, it's just the theory that I've learned, or I've heard that I, that I really attach to, is the notion that when we're babies, we're, we lay out flat a lot more. And so our weight, our air resistance, like our weight resistance comes from, like from our stomachs and up and down. And as we become upright, we feel weight resistance from the top pressing down. So we resist that and we breathe. Whereas when you're laying down, you have resistance in your it, horizontally. So you push upward horizontally rather than pushing from up here vertically, if that makes sense. Like you're pushing up from, from the stomach because you can't raise your shoulders 
when you're lying down. So that that's I like that theory. I, I don't know. I don't think we exactly know the answer to it, but that one seems to make the most sense to me. So I kind of go with it as, as a seems like a reasonable explanation for it. So what are some signs of poor breath support? There are several, um, but they manifest in different ways and different singers are going to show poor breath support in different mechanisms. So uh, it, there isn't really one one size fits all example of poor breath support, but I can give you a few. Uh, if you have a lot of air in your sound and you're talking like this a lot and you're kind of make like that, like that, that's really poor breath support because there's very little muscular engagement that's controlling the flow of air you're just pushing the air out all at once what that does is it causes you to run out of air faster so a lot of times when you hear singers that are making this putting this covered sound it's pushing out way too much air they can't make whole phrases they have to breathe in a lot more because they're using too much of it so that's a lack of engagement by the mechanism underneath um another thing that happens a lot when someone has poor breath support you hear them flat their pitches a lot you know, especially <clears throat> It's especially so when someone sings like a major third interval, if they have poor breath support, that major third will kind of sit somewhere in between a major and a minor third, and it will sound extremely flat and just kind of make you want to do this thing when you hear it, because it's just not quite there. And usually if you get more engagement from underneath in those in those intercostal muscles and in the diaphragmatic muscles, you get a little bit more engagement down there, you'll actually have a higher likelihood of hitting the pitch. A lot of times flatness doesn't come from people not knowing which pitch they're supposed to sing. They just don't have the right mechanism in place. They don't have the right support structure. Uh, a kind of quick side note, when I was in college, one of my uh, piano professors actually, and she also taught music theory, presented an idea to me that I thought was really interesting. Usually when people sing flat, they are they don't have good breath support or they um, sometimes it's that they don't have a good conception of what the pitch should be. But when someone's sharp, it's quite the contrary. Usually when people are sharp, it's because they're overexerting in some way. So they're pushing too hard or they are thinking too hard. So if you find that your pitches are sharp more when you sing, you're probably overexerting yourself. You just need to relax a little, do some breathing, right? Do some diaphragmatic breathing, which I'm going to show you how to do in a bit. Um, just relax. Allow your body to relax a little bit more if you're sharp. Now, if you're flat, that's probably either one, you need to learn what the pitch is and internalize it. And two, <clears throat> you need to get stronger breath support. You need to get more going up underneath you. I mentioned in one of my other videos that Jeffrey Wells, uh, the Met singer, did a workshop. And one of the things that he showed me and everyone else in there that really stuck with me was that once you get to singing at a high level, like like operatic high level stuff, you actually engage your quad muscles, the leg muscles and things to get that support too. And that was something that I never really embraced. I never really thought was necessary until I saw the difference through him. And it's true. Once you get to a certain point of singing, you have to have so much support underneath your body and take so little load off of all this up here. That you even start engaging some of those lower muscles. Now, I would not advise that for someone who's not like, technically ready because that does, it's very easy to like ugh, tense up and like push way too hard and get super muscle man about it, you know, and you don't want to do that. But the idea is, is really useful once you know how to control things a little more. So my whole point in saying that is to get used to the idea of your support coming from below, low down. You don't want your support feeling like it's all up here in your chest. You want it to feel like it's down below and kind of supporting you, kind of like a pyramid, like the bottom of a pyramid that's just stable and holding everything above it in place. So think about it like that. So really quick, uh, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon. Hopefully this is helpful. What I'm going to tell you is one of the best exercises that I give my students that don't understand diaphragmatic breathing. All you have to do is take a piece of paper or a book or anything. You lie flat on your back and you place the book or paper on top of your stomach. And what you do is you breathe in and you allow that book or paper to rise up. Your stomach wants to raise that thing up. And that is a sign that the diaphragm is expanding downward and creating space because the lower part of the, the rib cage pushes outward to allow the diaphragm to push down and air to come in. So when your stomach rises, that means the diaphragm has pushed down more like it should. So if you have the book or the paper on your stomach and you just let the, you, you set it there and you watch it rise and you hold it there for a bit and you get that feeling of fullness that comes from having the diaphragm engaged and you want to hold that there for a little bit. Don't, you don't want to faint. Like that's, that's a common risk that you have is like if you breathe in from the diaphragm too much, too often, you can pass out. <clears throat> 
So just do it, hold it a little while, lower back down slowly. And it's gonna feel like an ab workout a little bit, it's supposed to. And when you sing, lying down is easy to start out, but you have to be able to do that with the diaphragm when you're standing up. And so that's something that takes a lot of practice. When you're singing, you ideally want to feel a sense of fullness in your upper abdomen. You don't wanna feel like you're about to explode, but you definitely wanna feel like you're a little bit full at the top of your abdomen. That's a sign that you've got good breath support. And you'll find that if you have that breath support set up, it's gonna be easier to sing just about anything that you want to. Notes will come more easily to you. You won't feel like you're pushing quite as hard. So that hopefully clear, clarifies things a little bit for you. In my individual lessons, I can get a little more in depth about specific things you might need to do. And there is no one size fits all approach to singing. However, the breathing mechanism is the same on pretty much everybody. So you can be, be rest assured that this is advice that anyone can apply to their singing. Then it's kind of universally considered to be one of the best ways to help your entire mechanics of singing. So that's all I have for today. Hopefully that was a succinct enough sort of idea of what the diaphragm does and gives you guys something to kind of chew on in that regard. Um, I wanted to also say that I do give online voice lessons via Skype. I have a couple of students already. I do in-home lessons. So I also work at, my, at the studio in Atlanta, but, but I also do in-home lessons and I do online Skype lessons. So if you are interested in taking voice lessons from me, I'd be more than happy to help you out. Just leave me something in the comments and let me know and I can get back to you. And even if you don't want lessons, please leave a comment. Seeing you guys' comments and hearing you guys give some perspective and feedback and kind of hearing the things that you want to learn more about is awesome. And so I hope that I hope that you will continue to do so because that is really, really helpful to me as a content creator as to what you guys want. And as a result, it's allowed me to kind of come up with this idea of having sort of three different series of videos, so to speak, that I can give you guys better feedback and give you more of a direct response to the things that you guys want to see. So thank you so much again for watching. I hope this was informative and helpful. Please like and subscribe if this is something that you're interested in or if you want to see more videos in the future because I promise there's more coming and it will get gradually more professional looking as we go. I have a friend of mine who's actually one of my voice students and he's also a teacher at the studio who knows a good bit about video production and we're going to kind of get involved in, uh, in some things in terms of getting these videos a little higher quality. He's got some better cameras and things like that. So hopefully I'll be able to give you guys a little bit higher quality video, better editing, that kind of thing. So anyway, if you have comments, questions, anything, please put them in the comments. I'll do my best to respond. And I hope you guys enjoyed this and you all have a great day. Bye.